everyone. Thank you for joining us this Thursday evening at the Pikes Peak Library District. As part of the November celebration of Native American Heritage Month, we are pleased to welcome Judith Shi Savila, author of Code Talker, the first and only memoir by one of the original Navajo Code Talkers of World War II. Judith's presentation will last about 45 minutes, and if time permits afterwards, we will take questions for her. So please use the chat function of your Zoom screen to ask any questions throughout the presentation, and we will get to them at the end, uh, as many as we can. Chester Nez was a Navajo code talker, one of the original group of Navajo men who designed the Navajo Code and proved it in battle. Our country's indigenous people were key to our victory in the Second World War. In the Pacific arena, the Japanese managed to crack every communication code used by the United States. The Marine Corps turned to their Navajo recruits to develop and implement a secret military language and these Navajo Marines created the only unbroken spoken code in modern warfare and helped to assure victory for the United States. Chester Nez was a World War II veteran who indispensably served his country as a Navajo code talker. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2014 and Judith Avila is a Code Talker Scholar with the New Mexico Endowment for the Humanities Chautauqua Program. Before uh, the onset of COVID this year, she toured giving presentations on the topic, and we are very pleased to have her with us here today via Zoom. So Judith, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Brian. Can everyone see me? I hope. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna show you any slides in the very beginning because I wanna ask you to do something that I'll bet no one's ever asked you to do before. I'd like you to step out of your own life and into someone else's life. You're a young man, still in high school. Because you are Native American, you're not allowed to vote in the state where you've grown up, New Mexico. But you were raised as a warrior, and warriors protect and defend the people and the land they love. So when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, you feel pretty sure you're going to get involved with this fight. Well, Marine recruiters come to your boarding school in Tuba City, Arizona, and they take all of you young men aside. And they tell you, men, we're looking for 30 of you for a top secret project. Well, you and your roommate, Roy Begay, talk with each other and you say, do you think we could be Marines, it's a pretty daunting prospect. You have friends back on the reservation who were Marines, and it was a tough life. But you both decide you're going to give it a shot. So when the Marines come to interview you, you sit up as straight as you can, and you talk your best English. About 200 to 300 other young Navajo men also interview with the Marines. But lo and behold, you and Roy are both chosen among the 30. You're really excited at first, and then you're really scared. And one of the men drops out and never shows up at the bus when you're supposed to meet to go to San Diego. Well, when you get sworn in and loaded on the bus with all the other young men who are now Marines, your parents still think you're in boarding school. 
there's no way to let them know. They don't have phones, you can't call them, and it's a long trip to their home. So off you go to the Marines, no longer a student. Well, when you get to San Diego, wow, everything is so different. Big buildings and lots of traffic, just lots going on, that, things that never happened on the reservation. And one of the sergeants, a drill sergeant, meets the bus and he tells you, man, you darn well better good at good night's sleep tonight because you're going to be up at 5.30 in the morning and you're going to be running on the beach. You're Marines now. Life is not easy when you're a Marine. Well, <laughs> when he leaves, all of you start talking and you all agree, yeah, you ought to go to bed. And you all go to bed but nobody sleeps. But as promised, you get waked up at 5.30 in the morning and everyone in your platoon, platoon 382, all Navajos, everyone's out on the beach running with two pails of water to build your muscles, build your stamina. Well, Marine basic training it's not easy, and you knew it wouldn't be, but you're kind of surprised. And the reason you're surprised is because you're all doing so well. I mean, on the shooting range, you're better than any group they've ever had before. And for all the physical activity, you guys are fit, and you're on top of things, and you pay attention, and before you know it, the Marine Corps Chevron, which is the Marine newspaper in San Diego, starts writing about you. All 29 of you, since number 30, never showed up. And they say things like, you're fabulous examples of young American manhood. I mean, Navajos are raised to be modest. How do you deal with that? It becomes really embarrassing. It gets so you hardly want to look at the chevron because you're afraid they're going to say more stuff about your platoon. But everyone, everyone in the platoon completes basic and everyone does a great job. So when you're done, you get pulled aside to one of those um, portable classrooms and it has bars on the window and the doors will lock. So all 29 of you are led into that classroom and one of the Marines, one of the Marines goes to the front of the classroom, one of the officers, and he says, men, you've all passed basic. It's time for me to tell you what your secret mission is. Oh man, everyone sits up nervous. You can feel a knot in your stomach. Everyone kind of sneaks sidelong glances at the guy next to him. You're wondering and hoping that this won't be too dangerous a mission. Well, the officer at the front of the room says, man, I need to tell you, the Japanese have been kicking our butts in the Pacific War. Are they doing that because they're better fighters? Hell no. No, the reason we're having a trouble with the Japanese is they're intercepting all of our communications. Every code we use, they intercept and they break them all. Heck, we can arrange a rendezvous, and a lot of the time the Japanese get there before we do. So here's what your assignment is. I want you men to design a code, a code that uses English 
and Navajo. And it needs to be a code so clever that another Navajo could never break it. Well, you all kind of chuckle and look at each other. You're sure he must be kidding. Because in boarding school, if you were ever caught talking Navajo, you'd get kicked, hit, have your teeth brushed with that brown live fell snap the soap. I mean, it was not a good thing to get talk, caught speaking Navajo. But he soon makes you realize he's not kidding. He said, this is dead serious, man. This could make the difference between our winning or losing the war in the Pacific. Well, heck, he leaves, he locks the door, and you guys get busy. And you decide you'll start with an alphabet and you develop a really clever alphabet. And you also work together really closely and really well. And every night, one of the Marine officers comes to the classroom and lets you out. You put all your papers in a safe, all your working papers, and they bring your lunch to the classroom. You're in that classroom working. Well, after about 13 weeks, you actually have a code. And you let the Marines know that you think you're ready. You've got an alphabet and you've got words for things you're going to be using a lot that you don't want to have to spell. Things like fighter plane, that's hummingbird in Navajo. Or bomb, that's egg in Navajo, because when you drop an egg, it explodes. You're ready. So you demonstrate this code to the Marine brass, and they are so impressed. Well, it works so well in the demonstration that they immediately send you overseas to Guadalcanal where there's a battle raging. They're gonna see how it works in battle. And when you get there, one of the communications officers, Lieutenant Hunt, takes all of you young Navajo men, and there are 10 of you on Guadalcanal, aside, and he says, men, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I've got a real problem with this. You know, I have professional communications men working with me. What can a bunch of Navajo kids do for me? Oh man, well, you realize you're gonna have to convince him. You need to convince him to give you a test so you can show him how well your code works. So, all of you talk to Lieutenant Hunt and you say to him, Lieutenant, we really think we can help here. You need to test us. And very reluctantly, he agrees. He says, okay, tomorrow morning, first thing, I'm gonna meet you here on the beach and we're gonna have a test. So the next morning, first thing, he arrives on the beach and he has with him his communications men. And he tells you, hey, I have my best men here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to give each of you the exact same message to transmit and to get a response from. And he said, we'll see. My men are going to be able to do this in. Uh, probably about four hours. This is going to be a complex message. He said, we'll see if you guys can compete with my men. And remember, accuracy is really important. Well, he sends a couple of his men down the beach to receive the message that his guys are going to send. 
he, and he sends a couple of your men down the beach to receive the Navajo code message. And then he gives you each the exact same message. And he says, all right, guys, do your best. Well, within two minutes, one of the guys near you raises his hand and Hunt looks at him, puts his hands on his hips. He's disgusted. He says, are you lost already? Two minutes in? And your buddy says, no, sir, we've completed the mission. Oh my gosh, Lieutenant Hunt just can't believe it. I mean, his chin drops down to his chest and he says, completed the mission? Two minutes? My guys have four hours to go. How can that be? Let me see that paperwork you generated. So he takes the message he gave the Navajos. He goes and gets the message that was transmitted to the Navajos down the beach and translated into English, and he compares them. And they are exactly the same. All the punctuation, every word perfect. Well, he studies his feet for a while and kind of walks back and forth and Finally, he gets you all together and he says, Men, holy shit, I think I can use you. Well, using you as a code talker means you sometimes are sending messages for 30, 40 hours at a time with no sleep, no rest, no food. It's rough. And sometimes at night, you and Roy in the foxhole can feel the tears running down your face. And you ask each other, do you think it's always going to be this scary? And you both agree, yeah, it probably is going to be this scary. But you tell each other, think how proud our families are going to be. We're actually helping to win this war. When we go home, we'll be heroes. And yet through the war, talking to each other, encouraging each other. You never get to go to R&R &R because there aren't code talkers to replace you yet. It's tough. You're in battle for nearly three and a half years. And when they send you home, they tell you, men, you can't tell anyone what you did here. We can't let anyone else know about this Navajo code. We might get to use it somewhere else because it is so darn good. The Japanese can't break it. So you go home to no fanfare. No parties for you. And if you're told, if you're asked, what did you do as a Marine? You tell them what the Marines told you to say. You say, they issued me a gun and they told me to go shoot the enemy. And when you interview for a job, you can't tell the person that's interviewing you about what you've already accomplished. And neither, of course, can your code talker friends. As a matter of fact, a lot of those young men don't end up finding a job after the war. They end up dying young after just a couple of years from depression, suicide, alcoholism. And you really, really want to be able to tell your dad because he's getting older and you're afraid he could die and never know what you've done with your sacred Navajo language, but you gave your word, so you say nothing. Okay, you can stop, step out of the life of, I'm sure you guessed, Chester Nez, and I'm gonna tell you some more about the Code Talkers. <laughs>
this first picture is at Fort Wingate. And the young men in this picture are the guys who were first recruited as code talkers with you. Right out of high school, some of them had to lie to the Marines to be accepted. This is most of the first 29 of you. And Chester is in the middle in the front row with his arm across his knee. And this is a close up of Chester, just a young man like all the others. There was one man in his 30s, and that was Carl Gorman. He had to lie about his age and make himself younger. Most of the others had to lie and make themselves older. Now, in talking to Chester, and I recorded his stories for, oh gosh, on and off for three years. I was so fascinated with the fact that these guys were perfect code talker material. I mean, immediately they were great Marines. They did everything they were asked to do. They just were incredible. And I kept wondering what made all these young men so perfect as code talkers. And after the period of talking with Chester, I realized the more and more I got to know him, the more and more I had to respect the tradition in which he'd been raised. And I realized that there were basically five things thanks to Navajo tradition that these young men had been raised with that made them great code talkers. And those five things that they had to have to be good code talkers were stamina, the ability to cooperate, the ability to memorize, the ability to think under pressure, and the willingness to leave the reservation and become a Marine. Now this slide that I have up is the area where Chester grew up on his grandmother's land. His mom died when he was only about three. So he lived with his dad and his grandmother and his sordid aunts and uncles and cousins. And these corrals here against the mountain were for the sheep. So the sheep were put in the corrals if they couldn't go out with the other sheep during the day looking for food. You can see the grass looks kind of dry here. And they, they take 300, 500, 1,000 sheep eventually every day, take them out to find good grass so they could eat on the reservation. Well, Chester said they would walk maybe 15 miles a day, and he was five years old. And this was an everyday thing. And if for some reason he didn't go out with the sheep, he'd be fixing the corrals, taking care of things that needed to be fixed. So he had tremendous stamina, the first quality the code talkers needed. Now, all the other young men raised sheep on the reservation too. They all had that kind of stamina, but they had more than just a physical, I can hike kind of stamina. They also had a mental stamina. Now this slide is called a summer house. And that kind of makes you think that this is where someone lived in the summer. Well, actually, this is where Chester lived full time through all seasons. And he was about 10 or 12 when he and his dad and his uncle finally built a Hogan. Well, you can see the summer house. It looks pretty leaky and not very warm. 
And during the winter, it was cold. And during the summer, it was hot. And I asked him, how, how did you manage? And he said, oh, in the winter, we'd build a fire every night outside and we'd all sit around the fire. And then when it was time to go to bed, we'd wrap in blankets and we'd run inside all wrapped up. And I said, but your grandmother, didn't you tell me you lived with your grandmother? And he said, yep. And I said, well, how did she handle this? And he looked at me and he got a little smile on his face and he said, you know, it wasn't easy for her. She cooked all our meals in all kinds of weather, freezing or hot. And he said, this was where she lived. He said, she never once complained. Stamina. Now this is the Hogan that Chester and his dad and his uncle built for grandma. And this Hogan, when I took the picture, had already collapsed. There was a dome-shaped roof on it when they first built it, and it was eight-sided. And you can see the timbers are nice and heavy, and they filled all the chinks with mud. So the Hogan was a huge improvement over the summer house. It wasn't real big. And you see the door there. Well, it didn't have a door when they first built it. Actually, this is the one they lived in. That one totally collapsed. This is the same kind of building. That door had a rug across it that Grandma had woven. And they had the domed roof that I mentioned. And the way they made the dome is they made the wood of the eight sides shorter and shorter and shorter. So as it built upwards, the pieces had to come in to fit together and they formed a dome. In the middle of the dome was a hole for the smoke from the cook stove. So you can see these guys really had stamina. Chester said he felt like a king living in that Hogan. Well, the next thing they had to have to be good coat talkers is they had to be able to cooperate. Now, I used to work for Digital Equipment Corporation before they went belly up. And believe me, if someone had put 29 of us in a room and told us to design a code, ah, oh, I think we would have killed each other. I mean, there would always be somebody who had to lead the group and had to come up with all the ideas and would be upset if someone didn't like their ideas and there'd be other people who didn't agree with anything the leader, self-imposed leader, came up with. And so I asked Chester, well, how did you do this? How did you work 29 of you together designing a code? And he looked at me kind of like he wasn't quite sure he understood my question. And I said, well, didn't you have a lot of disagreements, a lot of fights about what it should be like? And he chuckled and he said, no, we were all working on the same thing. We cooperated with each other. We all had ideas and we all respected each other's ideas. Well, right here on this slide is one of the first ideas they had. This is how they set up their alphabet. And it's very clever. They decided that it would be doubly encrypted. There would be an English word for each letter of the alphabet. And the English word would begin with that letter. But they would then translate the English word into Navajo. And so A was ant, Wolachi in Navajo, and B was bear, shush in Navajo, and C was cat, mwasit in Navajo, and so on. So when they spoke the letters of the alphabet in their code, they didn't say ant, bear, cat. They said, Wolachi, shush, 
Mwase. So there was no connection between the letter and the word that represented it. None. Unless someone knew to go from Navajo to English to get to the letter. Pretty clever. And this whole alphabet I thought was really, really cool. Okay, this is the view from Grandma's house. And we're still talking about cooperation. Well, there was a lot of land out there. And all the Navajos on the reservation shared the land with the sheep. And you could take your sheep wherever you thought would be a good place for them to find grass. And they ate the lower limbs of juniper trees, pretty much anything they could find. And no one ever said to you, hey, hey, get out of here. This is my place. This is for my sheep. No, they all cooperated. And if someone was sick or someone had to go out of town for some reason, everyone else would chip in. Everyone else would chip in and help. So you would take care of your neighbor's sheep if they needed you to. You cooperated. All right. The third thing that you had to have to be a good code talker was the ability to memorize. Now, Navajo was not a written language at the time these young men were recruited to design a code. Now, later on it was, but back then it wasn't. So no one could buy a book and learn Navajo. So that was a big advantage. But the young men, the young men all grew up sitting around fires at night with their family. And everyone would tell stories. Grandma, Ma, and uh, Dad, and Uncle would all talk about history. And you would learn the history of the Navajo people. And if you wanted to have a family someday, and you wanted to teach your kids that history, you had to memorize those stories. You couldn't write them down. Navajo wasn't written. You couldn't go to the library and get a series of the Navajo traditional stories in Navajo. They didn't exist. You memorized everything, everything. If you went to market to find out for grandma how much mutton was going for, or how much she might be able to sell one of the rugs she wove for. You memorized it. If you were going to find out how much wool was going for, you memorized it. You memorized everything. So that eventually, when you had to use the code in battle, it was easy for you to remember what it was. All right, we're up to the fourth thing, number four, that these kids had to have in order to be good code talkers. And that is thinking under pressure. Well, look at this slide. This is on Peleliu, one of the islands where Chester fought, although these are not actually code talkers. I got this out of the marine archives. Um, and you can see how these men are just behind a little flimsy wall of stones and they're shooting at a house that's right nearby or a shelter, not probably a house. But this would be kind of a tense situation. But you code talkers were told, you have guns, men, and you're all excellent shots. So I hate for you not to be able to use your gun, but if there's a message to send, the message takes priority. You send the message. Even if someone's shooting at you, you send the message. So you'd be in the middle of a battle and the co-talkers were generally towards the front with the artillery 
so they could send all kinds of messages about where the artillery needed to send their ordnance, and you'd be shot at and you weren't allowed to shoot back. You'd have to send messages. You'd have to remember that code with people shooting at you and you read the message you're going to send in English that was given to you by the officer. And as you read it, you put your mic up to your lips and you translate it into the Navajo code. I can't even picture beginning to be able to do something like that under that kind of pressure. I just can't imagine it. Where did they get this kind of courage, this ability to think under pressure? Well, these young men all went to boarding school. And boarding school was a rough, rough place. The matrons and the teachers were downright mean. And they were always watching for you to make a mistake. Chester said, he could feel kind of a rock in his gut all the time and he could feel them watching him just hoping he'd make a mistake so they could kick him or hit him or hit him with the ruler and he said they picked on the little kids most of all so being in boarding school forced them to be able to think under pressure. I had to put this one in because I like it. And it's really a posed picture. He's not really under pressure in this one. But in boarding school, these kids all knew they were gonna be beaten if they made a mistake. And they all knew they were being watched every minute, every minute by the teachers and the matrons who were halfway hoping they would make a mistake, according to Chester. So they learned to think under pressure. Now the last thing they had to be willing to do is to leave the reservation. That was a big deal. They couldn't become a Marine without leaving the reservation. And most of these young men had never been away from the reservation except maybe for an hour or two in a car going to boarding school. But they never lived off the reservation. And this is the hardest of the five qualities for me to talk about. They had to be willing to leave their home that originally they saw as a safe place. Now this big red area is the main part of the Navajo reservation and the gray kind of poorly outlined squiggly area of the inside of it is the Hopi reservation. And the government put the Hopi reservation inside the Navajo reservation because the Hopis and the Navajos were enemies. And I guess they kind of figured they'd do away with each other. But then another one of Chester's little grins, he'd look at me and say, uh-uh, we became friends. We learned from each other. We lived side by side and we got along. Well, why would the kids want to leave this place where they had their family, they had a good life, it wasn't easy, but it was good, and they had the sheep, they had a good living a good economy. Well, in the Dust Bowl, in the early 1930s, when Chester was just about, oh, 10 through 13 or so, the government didn't know what to do. Well, let me tell you a little about the Dust Bowl. You probably know anyway, but just in case. The Dust Bowl was something that happened because the land had been overgrazed in the Midwest, all the way out into New Mexico and Arizona, and all the way up through Minnesota. I mean, it was a mess. The, the land had been planted, the trees had been cut down, and then there were some 
long, long droughts. And so the crops that were planted on that land died. And there were no roots to hold the dirt, the soil, when the wind blew. And for some reason, these few years, the wind blew like crazy. And the whole area was covered with dust. Sometimes a farmer would go out to his field and he'd find a couple of dead cows. And they'd be dead because their lungs were full of dust. There was so much dust. No one knew what to do, and there really was no quick solution because the damage was going to take a while to correct. I mean, when you've done away with the roots and with the plants that are holding the soil stable, they just don't come back immediately. But the government had an idea. They decided they could have scapegoats, and they decided that one of the scapegoats could be the Navajos. So they came out to the reservation and they said, hey, look at the mess you've made here. Look at all this dust. Look how you've overgrazed your land with your sheep. Well, the, the men came out with heavy equipment, heavy equipment, and they dug a huge trench on grandma's land. And they asked Grandma and Grandpa, how many sheep do you have? And Grandma and Grandpa said, well, we have about a thousand sheep now. And they said, okay, I want you to herd 700 of those sheep into that trench. Well, Grandma and Grandpa started to ask, well, what, what? And they said, don't argue, we'll arrest you. So, uncle your dad you your cousins you herded 700 sheep into the trench and the men sprayed them with accelerant and set them on fire wow well you could hear grandma and grandpa crying at night and asking each other how are we going to support our family what this horrible event did and it happened all over the reservation. Anyone who had more than 100 head of livestock were subject to this reduction. What this did is it convinced the young Navajo men that if they ever wanted to have a job, to have a family, to be able to support their kids, they couldn't count on staying on the reservation. You could work all your life on something and the government could come in and totally destroyed overnight. So those young men were willing to take a chance. They were willing to be a Marine. Now that covers all five of the things that these guys needed to be excellent code talkers. And the code these young kids developed never got broken. It was the only spoken code in modern warfare that never did get broken. I'm gonna show you a few more pictures and then we'll have questions, but these are kind of cool. I wanted you to see this one because this is the Pacific and this is of course where the Pacific arena of World War II was fought. And you can see between Australia and Japan that there's a lot of little islands scattered around, and many of them are separated by hundreds of miles. Now, that's why the code was so important. The different groups of Marines had to be able to communicate with each other and make plans and plan strategies. And the American strategy was to conquer the islands beginning down around New Guinea and stair step up towards Japan till they were finally on an island close enough to Japan that they could attack from the island. Now this picture is not code talkers, but it's a bunch of guys landing on a beach on an island. And they're in a Higgins boat, which was really a great boat because it only had a four foot draft. And that meant they could get real close to the island and then see that flat front on the boat? 
the bow is flat like a piece of metal, they would swing that down and it would be a ramp and they'd go down the ramp and onto the island with their guns over their heads like you see in movies. Now these are the islands Chester fought on and I'm gonna go kind of quickly because I've already used my 45 minutes. This was Guadalcanal, the battle there lasted for six months. That Guadalcanal, he used to say, it was terrible. We'd be sitting in the foxhole in water up to our waist. This is Bougainville. The battle there also lasted for about six months. And that's Bougainville, another soggy island. This is Guam. Guam wasn't quite as bad. Guam, the battle lasted for around 20 days, but still, these guys were fighting nearly full time. They never got to go to R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. That's Guam. This is Peleliu. Now, I always thought Iwo Jima was the bloodiest battle in the Pacific, but actually per capita, the number of people killed on Peleliu was far greater. So that actually was the blood, bloodiest battle in the Pacific. And the battle went on for, I think it was about two and a half months. And this was a rough island because it was surrounded by coral and the boats bringing the men in couldn't get into shore. So the men were dropped off on the coral reef and they had to wade in for 45 minutes to reach shore with the Japanese shooting at them. That's Peleliu. One of the things that bothered Chester the most was he said, we were in these beautiful, beautiful islands and look what we did to them. Now this is the island of Angaur and Chester went there just for a few days to help out the army. And one of the men in the army who didn't know what Chester was doing came up to him one day and put his 45 to his head and said, you damn Jap, what are you doing in a Marine uniform? I'm gonna kill you right here. Well, luckily Chester was able to convince him to go back and talk to his communications officer. And when they all got back to the officer, the officer nearly fainted. He said, this is one of my most valuable men. You take care of him. This is a drawing Chester made for his drill instructor when he first went to San Diego. This is Chester's wife when he first met her in school. This is Chester after the war. I'm gonna go fast now because I wanna have time for questions. And there he is on the left right after the war. He came back to Tuba City to visit the school. And on the right, well, a few years after that. And these are some of the code talkers from Albuquerque. Most of these men are gone now. But this was a day when there was a traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. These are the gold medals that were awarded to the original 29 code talkers in 2001. Unfortunately, only five of them were still alive at the time, but Chester was one of them. This is President Bush giving Chester his gold medal. And this is Adam Beach, who starred in Wind Talkers, and Chester on the left and Mike on the right, his son. And they, they worked a little bit with the people who put Wind Talkers together to uh, critique it and to help, help uh, publicize it. And this is Chester's family. In the, the three adult men in the back row are his grandson, Mike, and then with the headscarf, his grandson Latham, and then his son Mike, and then in the front, his granddaughter Shania, then Chester, and his daughter in law Rita. And right behind him is little Emery, his great grandson, Shania's son. And Emery has just graduated from Stanford, where he went on scholarship. Smart kid. And this is Chester's in my book. 
had to put a plug in there. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm going to get rid of my uh, sharing here, and I'm going to come back, and you can ask questions. Let's see here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Yes, thank you very much, Judith, for a fascinating and wonderful presentation there about uh, Chester Nez and, of course, your book, Code Talker, uh, can be picked up at libraries and bookstores everywhere. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, believe it or not, it was a New York Times and a Wall Street Journal and a USA Today bestseller. Really shocked me, but it's a great piece of history and it's something people need to know. Absolutely. Uh, one of our first questions from the uh, chat box is someone asking about the boarding schools that Chester and the other Navajo went to. Uh, were they given the choice to attend these schools? And were these schools there to submerge them in white culture? Or were they Navajo boarding schools? No, these were for the Navajos. They were not given a choice. If they did not go to boarding school, if their parents didn't voluntarily let them go, they would be snatched from the parents and taken. Um, and the purpose of the boarding school was to kill the Indians, save the man. And what that meant was to get rid of the native culture and to force the kids to adopt white culture. It was tough. He hated boarding school. After the war, uh, what did you, how long did he serve? And after the war, what did he do? Okay, he was in uh, the war for about three and a half years. And after the war, he um, interviewed for jobs. And he was one of the lucky ones who actually got a job. He got a job at the VA hospital in Albuquerque doing maintenance. He was a painter and he was very artistic too. As you could see from the slide I showed you of the drawing he had made for his drill instructor. And he painted murals and he also painted rooms if the walls of the room needed to be painted. But he liked his job. And he kept it his whole life. He retired from that job at the VA. And you had uh, said at one point that he was not allowed to talk about what he did during the war with his family or, or with his father. At what point did they give him permission to speak about his experiences? Well, this is one of the things that really surprised me. The war ended in 1945. It wasn't until 1968 that they were released from secrecy and were allowed to talk about being a code talker. And as luck would have it, Chester's dad was still alive. So he was really pleased that he was able to let his dad know what he had done with the Navajo language. And I asked him, how did your dad react? And he said, well, when I first told him, he was quiet for about two minutes. He said, I could tell he was struggling to control himself. He was so emotional about it. And then he looked at me and he said, I always knew they should use Navajo for a code. <laughs> <laughs> also in the book, uh, Chester talks about nightmares after the war and the yeah. ceremonies to help combat them. After the second round of ceremonies, was he okay? He was much, much improved. Um, Right to the end of his life, though, he did have nightmares and very realistic nightmares where he'd, he'd be yelling like he was awake, except he was asleep. Um, his grandson Latham remembers being waked in the middle of the night by Chester with a nightmare, hearing him scream from his room when he was living with 
Latham's family, his mom and his dad and his brother and sister. So those occurrences were not nearly as frequent after the ceremonies, but they still happened occasionally. And another question here. Were the code talkers used by the Navy or primarily used in tactical communications for the Marines? And did they use any code talkers in Korea or Vietnam or any subsequent conflicts? Okay, let me start with where they were used. The Navajo code talkers were all Marines and the Marines were part of the Navy. So the Navy um, was the umbrella over the Marines. Now, the same man who convinced the Marines to use Navajos to design a code also suggested to the Army that they should use Navajos for a code because the Army had the same problems that the Marines had been having. Uh, with the Japanese being able to decipher everything they said. And the Army, I, in my research, I came across the letter written back from some guy in the Army, I don't off the top of my head recall his name, but he basically said, oh, come on, a bunch of stupid Navajos? How could they ever help us by designing a code? Well, if you remember in my slides, the last island Chester fought on, Angaur, was the island that was controlled by the army. And they were having such a hard time with their communications, they begged the Marines to lend them a few Navajos. Kind of ironic. And after uh, his service in the war, did Chester ever live back on the reservation? Um, he used to go visit for months at a time because his younger sister, Dora, lived there. And he'd go and help her with shearing the sheep. She had sheep. He'd go and repair corrals for her. When she needed something, he'd go out there. But he um, had a lot he had to do for himself after the war. He'd been in 10th grade when he joined the Marines. So he had high school to finish and then he went to college. But after his third year, his GI Bill money ran out. And no one would give him a loan. So he dropped out of college and he got his job in Albuquerque. Eventually though, the University of Kansas where he had gone to school gave him after our book came out, they gave him a degree and they had a huge ceremony and they brought his family out there and put us up in hotels and it was wonderful. And I had said to someone, well, this is an honorary degree, right? And they said, no, this is a real degree. We are giving him credit for preserving this important history. So when Chester was given his degree, in this room in front of 200 other people who came for the ceremony. He held it up and said, I finally got my sheepskin. <laughs> That's an amazing, wonderful story. Thank um, you. And uh, I know he passed away in 2014. Uh, do you still yes. keep in touch with any of his family? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> All yeah. the time. Well, COVID has slowed things down some. But his grandson, Latham, the one with the scarf in the picture of the family, he's my boyfriend. So he lives with me. And two of his great nephews live with us as well. So I am very close to Chester's family. And towards the end of his life, when Latham was with me here in the East Mountains, Chester lived with us for six or seven months before he had to go into hospice. And I tell you, having that man, it was one of these things where my mom kept saying, oh my gosh, this is way too much. How can they expect you to be taking care of this guy? By then he had had both his legs amputated because of diabetes. But having him there was one of the biggest gifts of my life. He was such a wonderful, calm, soothing, just fine person 
every day I'd get up and I'd be eager to see him. It was a tremendous gift. Absolutely. Well, as we end uh, our time together here on this Thursday evening, one final question for you. Are there any co-talkers still alive? Yes, I believe there are three. One is Peter McDonald, who was a former um, president of the Navajo Nation. And another is, um, oh gosh, what's the matter with me? I can't think of his name. I think there are three. I wish I could think of all three names, but Peter McDonald is the most prominent of three because he's quite well known. He's been a politician in the Navajo Nation for a long time, and he's a very interesting man as well. Fantastic. Well, Judith, uh, thank you for being with us on this Thursday, and uh, thank you for being with us uh, as well. Um, make sure to check out her book about Chester <laughs> Ness. And, I uh, love being here, Brian. Thank you for inviting me. I love talking about the Code Talkers. They made such a wonderful contribution to our country. Indeed they did, and uh, it's always a, a good opportunity to explore a lot of the people who contributed to the Second World War and their histories and their culture. So we're so happy you were here to share it with us. Thank you. The greatest generation, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.